Yep. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Southern Maryland Audubon November 2021 fall program. My name is Tom Seaton, and I'm on the Southern Maryland Audubon Society Board of Directors, and I help out with our monthly programs. It's my great pleasure to introduce Bob Long as our program speaker tonight. Uh, I, I found out today that this is not the first time Bob has uh, presented to our group, but um, uh, he has led the Upland Game Bird Project, uh, which includes grouse, quail, and pheasant, as well as the venerable turkey from yes. the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. While watching Sean the Sheep. Services for the past 20 years. Uh, he holds a Bachelor's of Science degree from Virginia Tech and a Master's from West Virginia University and is currently a resident of Dorchester County. Many of us have encountered turkeys in Southern Maryland. In fact, uh, I see them in my neighborhood and I'm sure many of you have too. So this sounds like a fascinating subject for us to learn more about this uh, great species. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Bob. Am I using? What is that? Thanks, Tom. Can you can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so I will share my screen. We'll get started. I believe I presented over there in person a few years ago. I was looking back uh, about Bob White Quail, I believe. But it's Good to uh, good to see everyone. Uh, can you see my screen there, Tom? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Okay, so we talked about quail last time. Uh, been been a few years, and we're gonna switch over to a species that is doing doing a little better than uh, than quail, and uh, that's the wild turkey, which I think most of you should. Uh, be pretty familiar with and see uh, in, in your travels around Maryland if you spend any amount of time there. So let's try to learn a little bit more about turkeys and we'll uh, proceed through this and get, get it working. Okay, so we'll start off with the uh, uh, old story about Ben Franklin and the, you know, it, it, there's some truth to the, to the, the, uh, idea that he would have rather had the wild turkey as a national symbol than the bald eagle. So got some interesting quotes here from him. He, he didn't think that the eagle was a, a very honest or, or moral character. That he, they, they would perch in dead trees, wait for the fishing hawk, which I'm presuming he means osprey, uh, osprey to catch a fish and then he'd go steal it from him, which I've seen myself um, and uh, you know, so I guess he had a point there and he also thought he was a coward and uh, said that, you know, smaller birds, king birds, not bigger than a sparrow can drive him completely out of the district. So um, he, he thought that the turkey in comparison was a much more respectable bird and would, uh, would oh, not hesitate to fend off his territory from British guards. So, uh, so there, it's a, an interesting little story, and, and I don't know if he lobbied that hard, but those are some interesting quotes that you hear from time to time. Uh, we, and we all know who, which species won out and what's on our, our currency and, and various other, uh, you know, uh, symbols of, of America. But it is interesting to uh, think about what it would be like if, if the wild turkey was our national bird. Okay, so let's go back before even Ben Franklin's time and talk about turkeys you know, going way back. So they're in the family Pheasionidae, <laughs> grouse, quail, partridges, turkeys. They, uh, they show up in the fossil records uh, about 20 million years ago, uh, the ancestors of wild turkeys. And then the, the kind of turkeys as we know them probably evolved around 11 million years ago. So they've been around for a long, long time. 
uh, as humans and turkeys, uh, you know, once once humans en entered the, the picture, um, they were used for a variety of purposes. So there's um, uh, good evidence of the Maya and the Aztecs using turkeys extensively as religious symbols. They they almost like worshipped turkeys um, uh, in, in those cultures. Uh, Mexico is where they were believed to be domesticated. And it's kind of interesting. So, you know, this was two to 3,000 years ago. They domesticated wild turkeys, uh, which are, you know, were very similar to what, what we, we know as wild turkeys oh. now. The only reason it's there is so it's softened up. Spanish so explorers the came over. They, uh, yeah, they took these turkeys back to Europe and they continued to raise them in captivity and refine, you know, the breeding. Uh, and then European settlers came back to uh, North America and, and, and the U.S. Uh, they uh, brought turkeys back. So it, it was this interesting uh, way for turkeys to get, get back and, and, you know, be on our Thanksgiving table, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, so they also are an important food source for Native Americans and early settlers, and there's a lot of archaeological evidence showing that, uh, that Native Americans use turkeys extensively. Um, and there is some, some evidence that they, they tried to domesticate them as well, and there was probably a lot of that going on where, you know, they were hunting wild birds, but then also trying to, to uh, you know, had some, like, uh, captive birds that they would try to uh, uh, domesticate as well. So interesting stuff there going way back. So there's two species of turkeys and you're probably, you know, like you said, you're familiar with the wild turkey and that's what we have, but there's also the oscillated turkey. And so just to, to clarify, you know, these are two distinct species. Oscillated turkeys only found in Mexico and uh, parts of Guatemala I believe in the Yucatan Peninsula. Really cool bird. I'd like to get down there and see them sometime. Uh, uh, qu quite a bit different. Um, there's some similarities, but quite a bit different than our wild turkey. So of the species wild turkey, there are five subspecies in North America. Uh, we have the Eastern wild turkey, which is in shown in blue here, which is the you know, most abundant and widespread turkeys. Uh, pretty much any forested areas in the eastern half of the United States is, is going to have eastern wild turkeys until you get down to Florida and you run into the Osceolas down there. And then there's various other subspecies that are adapted to mountains or, or more uh, arid conditions as, as you move west. But like I said, uh, eastern wild turkey is what we're focusing on and it's what we'll talk about for the remainder of this program. Um, Pretty, pretty interesting birds. Uh, we'll cover a little bit of just some, you know, sort of basic turkey biology that, that you may or may not be aware of, but they spend most of their daylight hours on the ground. And I think everybody's familiar with that. They, they see turkeys walking around, but they can fly. It's a question I get quite often. They can fly well. Um, they can, I think they've been clocked going about 55 miles per hour. Um, you know, with, when they need to, but they prefer, definitely prefer to walk around or run from danger than they do uh, flying. They roost in trees at night, so there's a lot of predators that are looking to make a meal of turkeys, uh, more so in like western Maryland, um, but even, you know, throughout the, <clears throat> the state, you have, you have uh, foxes, uh, there's uh, eagles that will uh, take turkeys and, and some pretty interesting research that's going on recently with some, some advances in transmitter technology and things. They can kind of get a better picture of, of what's happening with turkeys. Doing some research down south, and they're showing that great horned owls are actually a pretty major predator of adult wild turkeys. And they're, they're getting them in, in, at night on the roost uh, where these owls are, are focusing in and on, the, on these birds. And, uh, and able to uh, kill, you know, even an 18 or 20 pound gobbler. So pretty impressive uh, feat for the owl, um, unfortunate for the, the turkeys, but um, interesting nonetheless. 
So what do they eat? They eat pretty much anything. They, they eat seeds, fruits, green vegetation, insects, you know, caterpillars, frogs. I mean, if it's moving, if it's, if it's protein, they're gonna be, be uh, eating it. So they're not very selective and, uh, and that serves them well. They can, they can adapt to a lot of environments. They're super wary birds and uh, anybody that has hunted them will tell you that they, they're not as, as silly as they seem if you see them on the side of the road. They have exceptional hearing and they hear about four times better than humans. And they have very sharp eyesight, which is estimated to be about five times better than humans. So um, yeah, so you can't get away with much movement or noise uh, if you're gonna try to outwit a turkey. These birds are very vocal and you know, we'll go through some of the vocalizations that they make. Uh, they're really vocal all year long. You know, breeding season in particular is when they're, they're making a lot of calls, trying to communicate with each other. But even during the fall and the winter time, you, you get out there and get it near a, a roost of turkeys, uh, they're, they're making a lot of noise. It's, it's pretty, pretty cool to hear. So let's look at some of the differences between the sexes. You've got males on the left, females on the right. We call them gobblers or toms. You'll hear, hear folks call them toms quite a bit. And uh, females, of course, are hens. Males are much bigger, uh, 16 to 22 pounds. Hens are much smaller. Males are the, these are the ones that you see displaying. You know, this is what you think of when you, when you think of turkeys, you know, they're black with that iridescence, big red, white, and blue head that kind of becomes enlarged and engorged, uh, you know, with, with blood when they're, when they're excited or when it's uh, uh, getting towards uh, breeding season, they're gonna become more colorful. And the hens are the ones that are nesting. It, like a lot of species, they're gonna be much more dull. Um, I'm sure you, you all are aware of that if you're, if you're birders, um, you know, the, these are the ones that need to uh, lay low, nest without drawing a lot of attention to themselves and, uh, and try to survive without predators finding them or their nests. So the, the males are also the ones that gobble and display. Hens generally don't do that, but they will. It will kind of puff up a little bit uh, with some territorial displays uh, towards each other. Uh, they make a little bit different calls. It's going to be uh, more of a yelping call, typically from the females. And then the other thing that's real noticeable between the sexes is this, this beard that protrudes from the chest of the, of the male. This is actually modified feathers. So these are feathers that, that kind of have evolved over time into hair like, uh, basically like a clump of hairs. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just something that males have. I'm not exactly sure what it's for, probably some sort of dominance or, uh, you know, sexual selection type of uh, characteristic on the bird. Uh, interestingly enough, most females don't have a beard, but in some populations, it can be up to five to 10% of those hens will have a, a small beard. Um, so look closely and, and if you got a flock of turkeys and you might see a, a bearded hen, I've seen quite a few over the years, not common, but they're definitely out there. And we can also learn some things about the age of, of turkeys, whether the bird's in the, in the field or in, in, in your hand, you know, you have, have a bird that you're looking at and that tail fan is the best way to tell if you if you're looking at a juvenile or an adult, so the juvenile will have these shorter tail feathers on the outside of that of that tail fan, whereas an adult will be symmetrical the whole way around. Uh, and then you can also look at their legs if they're close enough. Sometimes you can see this when birds are, are strutting in the spring. Uh, a, a jake, meaning a, a juvenile gobbler, will have a small little spur, and the adult gobbler's going to have a larger spur. And, these are, these are used for territorial, uh, uh, you know, it, fighting and, and determining uh, the, you know, figuring out the pecking order for these, these gobblers. Hens do, do not have spurs. So some other interesting little bits of trivia to uh, talk about at the Thanksgiving table. 
uh, female, you can tell who pooped in the woods by looking at the droppings of turkeys. Pretty unique for a wildlife species. The hens have this uh, ice cream cone looking, you know, swirly type of dropping and a gobbler has what I like to call like a cheese puff uh, dropping or J dropping. Uh, pretty interesting, cool stuff to teach your kids when you're out there walking around in the woods and you come across some turkey sign. You can also look at the breast feathers, which they often just you know, molt and you'll see some breast feathers on the ground. A gobbler will be black tipped and the hen will be a buffy brownish tip on that, that feather. Okay, so let's uh, switch gears a little bit, look at some Maryland wild turkey history. It's a, it's a, it's a good story. You know, there's a, there's a lot of negative news, I guess. Well, there's a lot of negative news with everything, but uh, it, with wildlife species, we hear about the ones that aren't doing so well, you know, and I have a couple that I, that I deal with a lot, you know, turkeys, or I, I mean, uh, bobwhite quail, ruffed grouse, you know, not doing well, you know, populations declining. Uh, there's also a lot of songbirds that are declining. There's endangered species that you hear a lot about. Um, but turkeys are a little bit of good news. So we like to tell this story and, and uh, you know, let people know that, you know, we, we have had some successes with um, bringing, bringing wildlife species back from uh, literally the brink of extinction. Uh, so you know, pre-colonial times, early settlers wrote a lot of a uh, lot of accounts of turkeys being very abundant when they arrived. But like with most things, we went through a period of exploitation, and you know, currently, you know, regulated hunting and timber harvesting is is can be a good thing for these species. You know, uh, conservation of these species. Um, and habitat management done in a, in a smart way can provide that, provide good habitat. But when we first came over here, there was none of that. We basically just uh, killed everything and uh, shot a lot of species almost to extinction. We cleared every tree without regard for uh, what, that, what that would do to these species. And the population suffered. It continued to decline for you know, a hundred or more years until they were essentially gone. 1919, our game warden said they were practically extinct. At that time, they estimated there were only a few hundred turkeys left in Maryland. So, you know, 1920 comes around, hey, we got to do something. And so the game agency at that time, I forget what they were called, maybe Forest and Park Service or something along those lines, uh, they said, well, we need to stop hunting. And that was a worthwhile effort, but it was a little too, it was too little too late. And, uh, and that it really didn't do anything to restore the population. There were still very few birds. So uh, that was also the time when, you know, they started to thinking, well, let's try to do something else. And they started to raise turkeys in pens. You know, these were birds that you could raising captivity, so it made sense to try that. They spent about 40 years releasing pen-raised turkeys until they finally figured out that this was not working, uh, re released about 33,000 birds and uh, no evidence at all that these birds knew how to survive or reproduce in the wild. So that was deemed a complete failure. So even as late as 1970, not that long ago, turkeys were really only uh, present in a couple counties and their population was down in, you know, maybe one or 2,000 birds in, uh, in 1970, really just relegated to these, these, you know, mountainous areas that were uh, more or less inaccessible, you know, that just some places that, that they, they uh, you know, were hanging on where there was uh, big blocks of, of forest and very little human encroachment. So, in the really, it started. It started in the late '60s, but it ramped up in the '70s and '80s through the early 2000s. Is the time period of restoration, and we used a technique called translocation. Pretty simple. We caught turkeys where 
they still existed, moved them to places that had good habitat that were not occupied and let them do their thing. And uh, really was, was uh, permitted by some of the recent technology. And I think I've got a slide or two talking about the, the rocket nuts, but it allowed the DNR with uh, help from the National Wild Turkey Federation to trap over 1,100 turkeys, move them around the state. And uh, uh, yeah, so this is the this is the cannon or rocket net. It's, uh, basically, three pipe bombs sitting on on top of a box that has that contains a net in there, and they're attached to the net. When you the, you bait the turkeys up in front of the box, detonate the uh, rocket fuel that is inside of these, and it propels these rockets out over the birds and. Hopefully you catch them. Pretty, seems pretty simple, but it took quite a while to perfect this technique. So this is, this is a photo of it, the box set up there with the rockets on top, turkeys baited into this, into this location. And then the net fires over top of the birds and hopefully you catch most of them. You can see they're pretty quick. There's quite a few that usually get out from underneath that net, but uh, if you have any amount of luck, you'll you'll pick off most of that most of the flock and uh, be able to box them up. So put them in these transport boxes, individual transport boxes, and take them to a new site and release them. So I got in on the tail end of this project. I came uh, about uh, two thousand and two so yeah so i had, had about seven or eight years worth got into this it was it was uh it was fun trying to uh trying to outsmart them but they're very difficult to catch it could be it could be uh very unpredictable you know they would maybe come by once every three or four days they weren't weren't uh it wasn't a daily event so you had to spend a lot of hours a lot of long days sitting in that blind waiting for them so here's an estimate of our statewide turkey population uh, since since the start of our restoration program and you can see it's tremendous success that population just boomed and within 40 years we have uh, or 50 years we have over 40,000 birds in the state so tremendous success <clears throat> uh, this gives you an idea of the relative densities of birds across the state. Uh, it's based on uh, some hunter data, but does a pretty good job of, of showing where the, the most birds are. You can see the Western Maryland where they were traditionally, traditionally turkeys out there doing, doing uh, well, holding its own. Uh, some, of these, some of these fringe counties, Frederick County right now is just phenomenal. There's a ton of birds in Frederick County. Um, uh, Southern Maryland as well is, is so down down your neck of the woods down there, uh, St. Mary's and Charles, a lot of birds, high density of, of turkeys, and they're, they're increasing all the time. Eastern Shore has had turkeys for quite a while, for 30 or 40 years. That was one of the first places that they were, they were kind of brought back to. Um, and so they're, they're doing quite well, but there are pockets there where they're, they're declining are starting to get somewhat concerned with what's going on there. We've had 30 or 40 percent declines in, in a few counties over on, on this side of the bridge. The central part of the state is interesting. They are rapidly increasing there. It is still low densities for the most part, but they're, they seem to be adapting to that, that suburban lifestyle quite well and, and at times causing some problems with traffic and you know, neighborhood uh, uh, problems when they get, you know, round folks and get on their roofs and scratch their cars and peck at their windows and things like that. So dealing with a little bit more of that in recent years. So these birds are generally a, a bird of the forest. I think, I think we all know that they, they generally are found in or near forest. Uh, you know, trees is, are needed for roosting areas. A lot of their food comes from trees as well, but where things have changed is biologists at, at one time, they thought they needed vast expanses of unbroken forest, you know, that 
they they just they needed these thousands of acres of of forest or they just couldn't couldn't uh, survive and what we've learned through this restoration is that they actually do best in a mosaic of forest and open land so honestly maryland's pretty good uh, place for a turkey to to uh, to live you know a 50 50 mix seems to be kind of the sweet spot they seem to do quite well in that in that uh, type of habitat and landscape a lot of times we get asked about home range and it's it's large you know they if you if you see turkeys in on your property one day and they're gone the next day don't worry they're just they're just wandering around they're doing their thing they use about 400 to 2000 acres um, as as a, a home range so they wander over a large area to fulfill their life needs so springtime in the turkey's life is all about breeding you know this is like most wildlife it's you know, they're trying to pass their their uh, uh, genes on to the next uh, generation and uh, males will gobble display to attract hens they have a uh, mating system that's essentially it's a polygamous mating system where uh, one gobbler will mate with many hens um, so there's always a surplus of, of gobblers out there typically it's that dominant bird you know the oldest bird biggest spurs, the most aggressive bird that, that's going to do most of the breeding. Uh, this is also the time that, you know, and, and we see we see that going on a lot. You know, we see in the spring, we see gobblers out there displaying to the hens. But what we don't see is these hens kind of, after they breed, they're kind of quietly sneaking off to find a suitable nest site. And, that, and we don't see that for a reason because they're they're trying to be, you know, pretty, uh, you know, reclusive and and try to you know keep that keep that nest hidden from from predators and you know they don't know that um, you know they're trying to hide it from foxes or or uh, coyotes or or whatever you know crows anything that might just uh, find that nest and predate it they're trying to keep that that nest hidden. Uh, this might be a good time to just throw in some some talking turkey. Let you hear if it works. I think it will. Let you hear some of the the sounds that turkeys made. So, like I said, they gobble. I mean, everybody knows the gobble. That's what the the male turkeys do. Let's see if it'll play. <laughs> Everybody's familiar with that. And that's actually gobbling mixed in with a little bit of hen cutting. They, that sharp, sharp clucking, that's what the hens will do to, uh, you know, really, a lot of times that's, that's when they're very excited and that will, that will get those, those gobblers to, uh, to gobble to it. They make a lot of other kinds of calls. I mean, I think there's, I don't, I don't know, I, I, I'm hesitant to say, but 15 or 20 at least documented types of calls that mean different things, pretty intricate vocabulary. And I'm sure we don't even know about a lot of the, the intricacies, um, but there's a fly down cackle that they often do. If you're in the woods, first thing in the morning, uh, happen to come across a, a, a flock of turkeys roosted, they will, um, a lot of those birds will make a cackle when they fly out of the trees, sound like this. And you can hear their wings flapping there as they, as they fly down. Uh, then, so it's a, they're a flocking bird. And when that flock gets separated, which happens, you know, predator, human, anything could, Scatter that flock. They have an assembly call that they'll use to call call everybody back together. Kind of a coarse, coarse uh, yelping call, and you can hear a little bit of the very high pitched calling in the background. Those are those are uh, younger birds, juvenile birds that are calling back to the uh, the adult bird that's trying to assemble the flock. And then the plain yelp is just the standard yelp that they use for a lot of things. 
Uh, most often you hear hens do this to try to attract uh, gobblers, so they're communicating with the gobbler. So that's just a little bit of a little bit of turkey vocabulary there, and there's there's a lot. It's a it's fascinating, you know. I've I've been dealing with these birds for twenty plus years now, and um, I feel like every time I go in the woods and you know watch them and observe what they're doing, I learn something new. It's just um, they're 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 really really cool to try to figure out you know what what they're doing and why and. Uh, only something to learn. Uh, it's just a video in here of their of their breeding ritual. Assuming it'll work. So you've got the hens that kind of just watching those those gobblers do their thing. This is a uh, this is a Jake. So this is a young a young gobbler has the short beard. And then there's the adult gobbler with the full tail fan. The adult gobblers are going to do most of the breeding. They're going to be the, the dominant birds most of the time. And they display, we, we call it uh, strutting. So they're going to be strutting where they, they puff their feathers out. And if you're very close to a bird that's doing that right there, you can see, so they drag their wingtips on the ground. You can actually find these strut marks. If you're in a sandy area, you can find there's, there'll be two lines in the sand where their wingtips are dragging on the ground. They'll wear these down. They'll wear, they'll wear a couple inches off of these feathers by the end of the uh, spring, just dragging them on the ground. You can see the spurs there. And that shaking right there, that quivering, that's actually, uh, it, it, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. We, we actually don't know how they make the sound, but it's this very low, uh, very low frequency sound that we call drumming. And it's, a, it's sort of a, a, a humming sound. You almost feel it more than you, than you can hear it. You only, you only can pick it up when you're within about 50 yards of those birds. Um, we think that they're sort of like expelling air out of their breast, kind of vibrating their feathers very rapidly and making a uh, making this low pitch sound. Pretty, pretty interesting and something you'll only hear if you're very, very close to these birds and really listening for it. So like I said, so males are doing their thing. We all, we all are familiar with that, but these females, they're sneaking off. They're gonna lay about an egg every day and a half until they have a full clutch, which is about nine to 13 eggs. And they're gonna put this nest somewhere that they hope can stay concealed for 26 to 28 days. Now they're nesting on the ground, um, which greatly increases their chance of a predator finding them. You know, you've got raccoons, possums, uh, foxes, coyotes, black rat snakes, crows, a lot of things looking to eat turkey eggs and or the, the hen if they can catch them. And a lot of hens get killed on nest every, every year. Um, so they're gonna put it in some very thick vegetation. It's very common to, for these nests to be found and, and predated. Usually around 25% of the nests are, are successful. So the poults hatch, you know, young turkeys are called poults. They hatch unlike songbirds and a lot of other birds that stay in the nest and have their parents feed them. Turkey poults are what we call precocial. So they're up and out of the nest within hours usually. Sometimes, you know, at, at the very most 24 hours they're, they're in the nest. Or, or they're leaving the nest, following that hen around and uh, looking for insects to try to gain weight and to get stronger. But during that time, they're very vulnerable to predation. So this is a time when this brood rearing habitat is super important. 
they don't have good habitat, uh, a lot of things are going to pick them off. You know, Cooper's hawks, um, you know, there's the, the, the gamut of predators are looking for these, you know, couple inch tall turkeys that can't fly, you know, a very, very limited feather development. So they're very vulnerable. So they need to find some good habitat where there's a lot of insects, but they also have like overhead covers. So these, these like fallow fields, wildflower plantings, you know, things like that are really, really important. We call these grassland or shrubland habitats. Super important for turkey brood habitat. And we, we often see the biggest broods, the healthiest turkey populations where you have this type of habitat. So they'll use uh, a lot of things, field edges, uh, some forests that have been managed to allow that sunlight on the ground to, uh, to you know, have that vegetation where it's not just leaf litter or pine needles. Um, they need some of that, that green vegetation there to hide them. Now, I just want to take just a little bit of a, of a tangent because I do deal with a lot of other species as well that need the same kind of habitat as turkey brood habitat. So like this, this grassland, shrubland habitat, you've got a variety of songbirds that use this. You've got uh, pollinators that are, that are, a lot of populations are in trouble with um, uh, bees and butterflies. And then you've got our northern bobwhite, which I talked about before, who is really in trouble doing okay in places where we have some large blocks of, of pretty good habitat. They're hanging on, um, but we really could use some more of this type of stuff out on that landscape. The uh, North American Bird Conservation Initiative put out this report a few years ago. You might have seen it, you know, talking about 2.9 billion birds gone since 1970. If you dig into that a little bit, you can see that forest birds have decreased some, uh, shorebirds a little bit more. Grassland birds, though, have decreased more than any other bird since 1970. Um, you know, this is turkey brood habitat, it's quail habitat, it's, it's you know, other, other bird habitat that we could use. So um, just trying to get the word out. This is a list of the most declining bird species in Maryland pulled right off of the breeding bird survey. And you can see the rates of decline uh, leading the list, which I hate to see is uh, Northern Bobwhite there, which we, we're working very hard to try to, um, save here and uh, keep, keep that population going. But in red, I've just highlighted all the ones that need this grassland or successional habitat. Um, just a, a real uh, dire situation for a lot of these birds that are just declining year after year because they depend on that type of habitat. Okay, so switching gears back into turkeys and looking at the fall and winter period. Now this is where these the time where these poults are, are, are growing, they're almost the same size as the hen, and uh, they're gonna gather in large flocks. It's all about the food at this point. Um, breeding season's over, they just, they just wanna survive the winter. And uh, oftentimes they're gonna really focus their, their movements and their uh, activity patterns in areas where there's mass producing trees. This year was a phenomenal year for oaks over here. There was white oak acorns, everywhere and those turkeys were sure just hunkered down uh, waiting for those those acorns to fall. Just a quick mention about habitat management for turkeys if anyone has property or knows of anybody that has property uh, it's always always something that uh, is, is you know you can manage for turkeys as well as these other species you can do things like forest management, tree plantings, you can plant native grass, uh, put in, install these field borders or filter strips. A lot of times this is like a win-win, helps water quality, helps wildlife habitat, you know, good stuff to do. Uh, food plots, some folks will plant clover or, or some other things to improve uh, uh, turkey habitat. And what I really wanna uh, mention is that a lot of these things can be paid for with these federal programs, these USDA federal, federal programs will provide uh, technical and financial assistance to install this habitat. So you really can't go wrong. If you've got some land and you're interested in wildlife, let me know. My email's coming up at the end of the, the program. Feel free to give me an email, uh, shoot me an email or, or give me a call and I can set you up with the right, the right folks to uh, make that happen. 
So with our wild turkey management program, just wanted to mention a few things about it. You know, our goals are pretty simple. We wanna ensure that healthy turkey populations are maintained statewide. We wanna make sure that we don't repeat the, uh, you know, the problems that we had a century or more ago and make sure that we you know, have these birds around for, for everyone to enjoy. We do a variety of population monitoring, uh, various surveys and you know, data analysis. We also do habitat management on public and private lands uh, that I've kind of mentioned uh, in the past couple of slides. And then secondarily to that, if we have healthy turkey populations, we can maintain some high quality hunting opportunities that we carefully, carefully regulate. So one of the surveys that we do that, um, and maybe some of you participate in it, it's a volunteer summer wild turkey survey. So we've been doing this since 1993 with essentially the same methods uh, for that entire time. So it's a really good long-term data set. This gives us a, it, so it's done in the months of July and August. Basically just volunteers out there, some of our staff, some uh, birders, landowners, farmers, whatever they may be, uh, they're just recording the number of turkeys they see by age and sex. So it's pretty simple, uh, not a lot to it. And uh, we get some great information. This is, this is one of the key pieces of, of data that we get. It's the number of poults observed per hen. So this is a really good index of how good that hatch was or how, how successful that reproductive season was. And uh, you can see that, well, there's a couple things, you know, average is about two to three poults per hen is, is average, but it, that average has been declining over time. It's a little bit concerning because if we're not replacing the birds that are dying, uh, and, and there's a fairly high mortality rate on, on turkeys, um, if we're not replacing those birds, those populations will over time start to decline. You know, it's, it's not going to happen in one year, but if you get several, years of poor production, you'll see that, that uh, population decline. Uh, something else that I thought was kind of interesting, wanted to pick out, uh, um, point out to you is uh, this brood X cicada emergence. So everybody heard, heard about that in the news and I guess uh, over, I don't know if you had them in Southern Maryland, but definitely Central Maryland, you, you, there was a lot of uh, cicadas took a few trips up there over the summer and they were everywhere. Talked to a lot of folks, said they were everywhere. But uh, yeah, so in 2004 was the last brood X emergence. We had record high number of poults per hen surviving that summer. You know, well over four, highest we ever had on record. I remember that was my, that was my second year here. And I remember wondering if it was, if it was related. I, I said, you know, there, there's really no, research done on this, or it was just a bunch of us biologists talking, saying, you know, everybody saw the same thing that year. We said, there's, turkey seemed to do really well this summer. I wonder if it's because of all the uh, cicadas that they could really eat efficiently and grow strong and evade predators. They didn't have to move around a lot to find food. And we had to wait 17 years to see if that was going to going to happen again. And uh, it wasn't nearly as noticeable this year, but we did see that increase. And, and if you look at it regionally, it's actually a little bit stronger of a relationship where in that central region where, where we had more cicadas, we, we had a, a pretty, pretty good turkey hatch that year or, or this past year. So interesting data there. Um, and lastly, I'll just mention something about our, our turkey hunting program. You know, it's regulated to ensure that it's sustainable. The majority of our hunting and our harvest takes place during that spring turkey season. Uh, this is the season where we can target males. So you're, um, you know, that's, that's the only legal bird to take is, is bearded, bearded birds. Um, always that surplus of males on the landscape. So we're really not impacting the population whatsoever. So it's a very sustainable type of hunting, very conservative from a population management standpoint. We have very limited fall turkey uh, season out in Western region where it's kind of a traditional season. 
And then we have a, a short three day winter turkey season as well. Both of these, you can take either sex. They're short, not a whole lot of participation, but if somebody wants to get their, you know, Thanksgiving bird put on the table, uh, they're, you know, organic free range, uh, you know, wild antibiotic free turkey, they have the opportunity to do that. And uh, more and more folks, doing that all the time, trying to get their, their uh, uh, food from, from you know, na nature and, uh, and, and there, there's nothing wrong with that. Good use of the resource and we're just gonna make sure that we monitor it and make sure that um, it's sustainable over the long term. Uh, just my, my kind of closing PSA, uh, we're, like I said, we're getting more and more reports of and I hesitate to say it, you know, nuisance wild turkeys, you know, turkeys that have overdone their welcome. Most, most people like to see them, but at times they can become aggressive. They'll chase the, chase the kids on the school bus or chase the mailman around or, or uh, what have you. So please do not feed the wild turkeys. Usually these problems uh, come from people feeding turkeys. Uh, and we've had some not only have it, has it created some nuisance situations, but we've had a couple of disease outbreaks that we can directly uh, trace back to these birds being fed and they're, they're transmitting this disease because they're in close proximity. Um, so please keep, keep our wild turkeys wild and, uh, and don't feed them. And that's all I had. If you've got questions, I. No, I think you said about an hour, I believe, Tom. I think you're muted, Tom. There we go. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Uh, let's see. We have um, we do have oh. questions. Okay, I couldn't see the the chat as I was going. Um, Here we go. Do you see the chat now? I can. Yes. Yep. So, do you want me to just go down through and answer some of these? Sure. Okay. Uh, some of them are directed at me to mute people, mute people, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we, we got that taken care of. That went well. Uh, yeah, cheese, cheese puffs. <laughs> You'll never look at turkey droppings the same again. <laughs> uh, oh, and, and ice cream. Okay. <laughs> uh, Charles County, 1999. Yeah, that's when that turkey population was really growing in Charles County. And now you see them every day. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, when were wild turkeys translocated to Southern Maryland? That would have been in the, uh, I'd have to look back at my records to see exactly, but uh, most likely in the 90s, most likely in the 90s. And, and then I, I, I participated in, uh, in a two, we took, we took a bunch of birds to Dameron, uh, Dameron in St. Mary's County in uh, the early 2000s. And I believe we put some, can't remember, but um, yeah, so in the in the 90s is when that happened. And then they, they seem to really take off in the 2000s. Yeah. Uh, Tiffany asked if wild turkeys, are wild turkeys not particularly territorial? They are in the breeding season. So the males and the females will, will uh, establish that, that social hierarchy and they'll start doing that in uh, like, well, they're maybe working on it all winter, but you'll really see that in the early spring. So like in March, you'll see a lot of, of if you're around turkeys a lot, you'll see gobblers fighting. It doesn't mean that they won't spend time together after that, if they're, they're a very close match, you know, uh, and, and sometimes they sort of team up and they, they join forces. They, There'll be a, a group of three or four gobblers that are all appear to be similar in dominance, and they'll just say, "Well, let's just all run around together and just and just uh, you know create havoc and and run all the other gobblers out of the area." And that that sometimes happens. Hens will do that. 
Bob, I was asking that because um, I, I was curious about the success rate of, of the translocation and, and how adaptable they must be to be able to just be moved around. And if oh, you can speak, okay. speak to the time of year that you do that too, um, mm -hmm. it, it must be, I guess, in the winter. When, when do you re translocate them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it would be it would be in the winter, usually January, February, March. So gotcha. prior to breeding season. So yeah, yeah, they 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 do move around quite a bit. You know, they it's kind of like they're looking maybe for something. You know, they, they don't quite know what they're doing, but survival was high, and 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 the, it, it it generally worked. You know, not in all cases, but usually if you release twenty or thirty birds, they would kind of do their thing it settle into an area um, and and their population would grow and expand but yep so yeah you kind of meant like do they do they try to get back to their to their their home i guess yeah i didn't phrase my question terribly yeah. well but it, it, it yeah the translocation part just made me think of it but your answer is yeah. perfect thank you yep yeah cool vocab the wing feathers are the ones they find on the ground. Okay, yeah, yeah, you'll find those wing and and they molt all their feathers. Um, so you will find, you'll you'll find all their feathers on the ground from time to time. So how many acres do you need to have? Dozens of acres or hundreds of acres? It depends on what else is around there. So uh, if you know if you only had you know, twenty acres. And you are surrounded by housing developments, you're probably not going to have a flock of turkeys using that. But if your 20 acres is connected to some other good habitat and it might meander through some housing developments or some shopping centers or whatever, then those birds probably could theoretically, you know, use, use those, uh, those couple dozen acres. So it just depends what's around the, in, the, in the landscape. And thank you, Lynn, for, I'm assuming you mean participate in the, the um, turkey survey. Excellent. Yes, indeed. Yes. Great. Thank, thank you. It's a, uh, we had a great, great uh, participation rate this year. So we, it's the first time we had online reporting available. So normally I would just send an email out and put sort of this old fashioned, uh, you know, survey form and I'd say you know, fill out the form and mail it back to me or email it it worked it worked fine you know it's what, what we've been doing since the since the 90s and uh, well we used to mail it well now now I would e I emailed it for the last 20 years or so and this year we did a little online data entry form online we went from about 80 or 90 participants to 740 participants on our turkey survey because we went online. A amazing uh, response, so. Uh, I was happy to see that. that, that made it nicer. Yeah, yeah, it, it makes our data very strong and very uh, accurate, you know, there's, uh, when we have that good of representation from. Um, Bob, I've got one question. Um, mm -hmm. Do you also grab data from the, Maryland DC Breeding Bird Atlas project. I do not. No, I mean I I will I'll look look at that, but not for that survey. Okay. So, because we try to keep the methods very similar every year, so that so that we you know have a comparable data set from year to year. Yeah, but we but we do look at other things. And just because my background was also laboratory science, um, what disease are you referring to? Is it viral? Uh, so, so avian pox is is something okay. that we see pretty frequently, um, and there's also a fairly recently discovered disease called lymphoproliferative disease virus, LPDV. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think that it, it, when we first found it about 10 years ago in wild turkeys, kind of concerned thinking that it might be a new disease, but we think that maybe now it's been here for a while and uh, been out there and not, not a huge concern. 
but we do see at times uh, some, some birds that are infected with that. And then the other one is blackhead. We'll, we'll get little outbreaks of blackhead from time to time. Uh, so, yeah. Has that mainly been up in Western Maryland with higher populations? Yeah, that's been where we see most of it, but there's been a few cases on the Eastern shore here as well. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So a uh, question, do gobblers have favorite leks or parading areas? Uh, yes, yes. We, we generally don't call them leks, uh, but, but they are a, a type of lek. Uh, usually we call them strutting areas or strut zones. These are areas where, where the gobblers will like to display. Oftentimes it's a, it's a place where they can be seen from a long ways off. So on the Eastern shore here, it's in fields, I'm assuming it's the same in Southern Maryland. I have some field that, you know, any birds that are in the surrounding wood Uh, we seem to have lost Bob. Can anyone hear me? Yes, I hear you, Tom. I he he's his video froze at least on on my feed. Yes, yeah. me too. Yeah, I I'm not sure what happened there. I have, think we have to wait for him to uh, log back on, right? Yeah, let's see if he tries to come back on because there might be a couple more questions. A lot of people are signing off, though it looks like. But I was curious because I would like to see, um, you know, breeding evidence for the BBA3 that I, you know, short of sitting out there under a hide, I'd like to know <laughs> sort of what, what to do to see it. Yes. And I have recorded some activity, Tiffany. Uh-huh. But that's why I, I wondered if he grabbed that data. But... Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, I know I'm definitely going to add to that database because I see wild turkeys all the time uh, on, uh, on the BBA3 stuff. Yes. Um, I mean, I see them parading up and down my road from time to time. It, they're, it's just incredible. Oh, that's in cool. A, in, in, a in a subdivision, for heaven's that's sake. That's so I mean, funny. Yeah. We see that one chat that I put up there. I had like four or five months ago. Yes. About 30 of them all around my house and on top. And it was like wild. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. It, it, only time that's ever happened. It was crazy. Uh, Bob, I think, is back with us. Um, <laughs> Hello. Hey, yeah, I'm, he I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The, uh, yeah, I, I got it on my phone. The, um, our, our power went out here at the office. I, I, I came to the office to make sure that I had enough bandwidth and I, uh, you know, things, did, things didn't bog down. The lights all went off, my computer shut down, uh, and, and now it came back on. Um, so on Mom, thank you. Thank you for coming back, Bob. <laughs> I yeah. figured everybody, everybody might be gone by the time I got back. Well, no, we, we were know. talking turkey without you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we, I, we, were we, we were talking about how we see them, uh, many of us are involved in the Bird Breeding Atlas 3. And, you know, I, for one, see them frequently in the mm -hmm. mornings when I go out in June and July. 
uh, in many locations around here. So I definitely want to get on board with the uh, with that uh, survey you're doing. Yeah, if you've got my email, just uh, you can email me. I'll put you on the distribution list. And it's yeah, great. It's pr it's pretty painless. I don't. Uh, Lynn can tell you. I, I I might send a reminder here and there to you know. Here's here's yeah. the survey. So so Bob, like, um, could you or Tom, could you drop Bob's email into the chat so that other participants might might be able to contact him as well? If they want to do the survey too. Yeah. If we think about it next year, too, we should share it with all of the Audubon members. I don't yes. know why we haven't done that. I didn't think that's of a it. great idea. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, we were talk talking, we were talking about BBA3, Bob, because I had a question in the chat that um, if, if I want to try to observe breeding behavior in wild turkeys, um, you know, short of getting in a hive somewhere. Do you have any suggestions for what to do or what to look for or particular habitats to go to? Well, uh, Since they're the so far way, ranging, you know. Yeah, the best way they, in the spring, they tend to be fairly uh, reliable in, in certain areas. So they, so they, they, there's cer certain areas that they like to strut in. They like to roost in in the spring. And it's not 100%, but generally, if you go out right at daylight and you listen for that gobbling, uh, almost every bird out there will gobble right at, right at daylight. I mean, I'm talking like right when the sun's coming up. Uh, so you have to get out there early, but you will, you'll be able to hear these, these hot spots where these flocks are hanging out. March, April is probably the, the March and early April is probably the best time. They're still grouped up into flocks. And uh, like I said, establishing that pecking order. They're very vocal that time of year. So go out right at daylight, listen for that gobbling. That'll give you a good idea of, of where to go. So, you know, any kind of state parks or um, wildlife management areas, places like that, that you have access to that you might go birding at, um, you know, be, be listening there, uh, pre presuming that there's an, uh, or assuming that there's enough habitat there to support turkeys. Awesome, thank you. Is, is the, Bob, I've I, seen, I, I've been able to um, find them too. Um, have you noticed that they'll respond to the honk of a, ho a car, a car horn? Yeah. They'll get them gobbling it. Yep. yep, yep. They, they I will, um, <laughs> they'll, they'll do what we call shot gobble where they'll gobble to any loud noise so yes uh, hunters will use a uh, like a crow call because or, or a, yes uh, and a barred owl call any kind of like sort Done of loud noise. yeah so that's uh, a way that you they can get them to trick them into giving away their location but they, they get smart to it pretty quick though but the, be <laughs> the best uh, the best the best locator call you know uh, way to get them to shot gobble was actually thunder it was it was a research project done and thunder played on a on a uh, speaker big loud speaker got turkeys to gobble more than any other sound i have noticed that yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so bob cool. um, oh i had a question go ahead Oh, but you can go. Well, I, was, I, I was just going to say, I didn't hear you say any facts like how fast they fly or how high they fly. Because oh. if they go you know, 2,000 acres, they can fly for a fairly long distance. Right, right. So they, um, they generally fly for short distances. So they're not, they're not going to, you know, they're made for just sort of quickly taking off and then gliding. They, they don't just fly, fly, fly like a, like a goose. Um, so yeah, so they're, generally they're not going to fly and they might spend you know, days without flying, except just to go up onto a tree branch. Um, all right. So they don't, they don't migrate at all. Nope. They don't migrate. They're, they're okay. ba basically resident birds, yeah. but they fly, okay. they can fly fast when they need to, you know, quick, short bursts just to escape danger. 
they can fly up to 55 miles per hour is the number that I've heard. All right, thank you, thank you. Bob, why has, why is it, do you think the turkey has declining, is declining now? Um, is it habitat? Yeah, that's a great question. So I don't think I mentioned it, but we're, um, we're starting a, a research project next year with in cooperation with Pens uh, Pennsylvania. So it's gonna be a three year project and we're gonna look at uh, turkey ecology, you know, survival, nest, nesting ecology, um, you know, predators, just the, the, the whole gamut of things that are going on with turkeys. Try to get a, try to tease apart what's happening in places where turkeys are doing well and then to places where they're not doing as well. So, yeah, we don't, we don't really have those answers yet. I, I have suspicions that maybe there's some changes, uh, sort of some gradual changes in predator communities over time. Mm -hmm. so that could be it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's actually going across, going on across the country. Uh, some really uh, alarming declines in the deep South. So places where they actually had turkeys, uh, strong turkey populations for many, many years, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, Arkansas, you know, some of their populations are down like 60% uh, in the last couple of decades. So they're, they're really worried about it, you know, trying to figure out what's going on. Is it possible it's related to uh, raptors doing better, um, big raptors? Um, yeah. Just a thought, like red-tailed hawks. I'm seeing a lot more red-tailed hawks around here. Yeah. Um, bar, I don't know about horned owls. They don't seem to be that common still, but they're around. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but, I, I think but, it's, it's definitely worth looking at. You know, I'm not gonna say that that's what it is, just anecdotally. Right. <laughs> You yeah, know, but sure. <laughs> but yeah, you know, you you look at the trends of 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 um, you know all raptors. They're pretty much all increasing at the same time that that a lot of these uh, you know game birds are decreasing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it makes you makes you wonder. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you had wild turkey? Eaten? Have you eaten wild turkey? Yes. Yes. How, how does it compare Me to? Too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is it better than store bought? <laughs> uh, it's different. It's, it's different. different. Yeah. It is, it is nothing like a butterball. No. <laughs> no. Nah. Yeah. No. It doesn't have all that good fat, juicy. You know, they're lean. Yeah. So. <laughs> exactly. But it, you look. You learn how to how to. Uh, prepare it where it's it's it, you know it's it doesn't dry out but if you try to cook it like you do a, a turkey in the that you get at the grocery store it, it'll it'll be dry and uh maybe not the best but yeah grilling it yeah so there's there's different ways to do it but yeah i, I, eat, a, I eat a lot of turkeys so. <laughs> <laughs> well it's probably good for you <laughs> yeah. um was there any Let's see. I don't know if there were any other questions. Um, I do have one question. Hello? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, um, it's a long shot and may not mean anything, but I understand that DNR began reintroducing wild turkeys in 1970. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Right about right around there. Yep. Okay. Well, back in 1962, I came across a wild turkey not out in Garrett County, but in Montgomery County, in a remote section um, north of Seneca. And it was a wild turkey. It had the copper colored uh, tail feathers. I was just a kid then, of course. But mm -hmm. I always wondered if that might have been uh, from a, a relic from the original population. Yeah, I, it's kind of tough to tell, but it. it could have been, or maybe it was uh, one that was hanging on from, you know, that was still the time period where they were releasing these uh, pen raised turkeys. So they, they would have looked the same, you know, they, they were, they were basically raising wild turkeys in pens and releasing them. So. Oh, oh th that period when, when uh, it was generally not successful. Exactly. Yeah. It wasn't very successful, but they, these, these birds would, they would, survive well, that, for some period yeah some period i guess time. that's 
I guess that's more likely than it had been from a, um, a relic wild population. Yeah, yeah, it, it's 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 tough to say, but most likely I would say it was from from those released turkeys. Yeah. Okay. I'm just typing in uh, your email here, Bob. Yeah, I think I think I had um, typed it in or a little earlier. And I don't I can't see the chat now that that was <clears throat> so if, I, if anybody had anything on that original chat, it's just all I can see is what what was typed in since I came back. Um, uh, this is Cindy. I have two questions. Uh -huh. The first is, since I have a swamp in the back, I have a lot of barred owls. Could they mm -hmm. take an adult turkey? Mm -hmm. I don't think a barred owl is big enough. I've never heard of that now. Okay. The other question I have is, many, many, many years ago, I saw a wild turkey in West Virginia. I really think that that probably was not a released bird. So is mm -hmm. that probable? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, uh, Western Virginia, they still, they had turkey populations. Uh, and, and, and we did in Western Maryland, you know, we, so it was like that mountain area, the birds, they, they hung on, they, they were, they never disappeared completely in those areas. So the, the restoration efforts were mainly to bring them back to the other 90% of, of our state. Okay, and the last comment I have to make is uh, one time when I was looking out the back, I saw something strange in the top of my pine tree, three stories up. I thought they were vultures until I got out the binoculars and realized they were turkeys. So <laughs> I suggest birders actually look at those birds at the tops of those high, high trees. Because sometimes they may have a heck of a surprise. Yeah. Yep. Was that during the, is that during the daylight? Uh, Cindy, was it daytime? And they yeah, were daytime. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, sometimes that sometimes they'll hang out in the trees longer. Like most of the time, they're only there in the dark. They just fly up right before it gets dark, and then they fly down as soon as it gets light. But um, but yeah, so occasionally, like especially on poor bad weather days, they'll they'll stay up in the trees for a while. Okay, uh, I don't see any other questions on the chat. Last chance, anyone? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank You're you, welcome. Bob. This is, yeah. Thank this you, good awesome. job. Yeah, this has been great, thank Bob, thank you. Thanks, I'm Thanks, happy to Bob. see the, uh, happy to see the, the participation. Some of these are, are <laughs> less, less well attended that I've done <laughs> recently, but uh, very good. <laughs> Thank yeah, you I, think so you, much. You, I think you've got some recruits for your uh, survey. So excellent. Yep. Very good, Bob. Very good. Thanks again. Thanks a lot. Good night, Bye. everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. 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 Good night.